Hi, I'm Derek Heidemann, and I'm the Director of Collections Research here at Old Surbridge Village. The village is very fortunate to have a, a sizable collection of uniforms and equipment of the pre-1840 militia in New England. And so today I thought that we would look at a piece, a newly acquired piece, um, which is this artillery coatee that comes to us from the state of Connecticut. Um, the coatee dates from roughly 1825 to 1840. Uh, and so I thought, thinking about Connecticut in that time period, we would start by talking a little bit about how the Connecticut militia was organized in the early 19th century. So Connecticut, like many other states in the Union in the time period, is going to have a sizable militia that is primarily composed of uh, what are called the, the battalion companies, the infantry companies, the standing companies sometimes. And these are the men that are required to serve in the militia, usually not taking it very seriously, wearing their everyday clothing, and armed with muskets. But there are more elite companies within the militia that are much more martial in their appearance, uh, much more professional in their bearing on the field and their drill and the rest. And those are what are referred to as the volunteer, the independent companies in the early 19th century. And there's a series of different types of companies that were called the volunteers. So for instance, there were light infantry, there were cavalry, there were riflemen, and there were artillery as well. So the, the artillery will be the units that are armed with cannon, um, just like they would be in the regular army in the time period. And the state militia, those cannons are actually being provided by the state. So in the state of Connecticut, there were actually four regiments composing one brigade of the state militia's artillery. And all of the various companies of those regiments were spread out throughout the states so that each regiment effectively of the militia would have um, you know, their cavalry and their riflemen and their cannons as well. So, the cannons being provided by the state, the uniforms though were not provided by the state, although the state did have a lot to say about how the militia should be uniformed. And one thing they tried to do, not just with the volunteer companies, but with the militia in general, to try to make them more professional and make them appear to be more of a military force was to try to regulate a uniform for the militia across the board. So in February of 1812, the Connecticut General Assembly passes an act that essentially says that the Captain General of the state militia has the authority to basically implement a uniform that will, war that will be worn by the state militia. Um, for the infantry, they talk about a blue coat with red facings, so very similar to this one here, but it's going to have white metal buttons. So usually they're pewter, sometimes silver plated, and then the inside of the skirts will be lined with a white wool typically. The artillery, on the other hand, is going to have a blue coat faced in red with yellow metal buttons, usually brass, but sometimes also gold plated. And then the inside of the skirts would often be lined with red. So this one pretty much fits that mold of the artillery uniform in the time period. One of the incentives for, for actually getting a uniform in the state of Connecticut was that if you actually showed up to the trainings, which happened a couple times a year, wearing your, your state mandated uniform, you actually would be relieved of having to pay your poll tax every year. So it was a little incentive to make the militia a little bit more professional looking, but also to make it a little bit less of a burden on the men that actually served in the militia. So I talked a little bit about the, the state of Connecticut and how it mandated a particular uniform to be worn by the artillery, um, but there's another indication on this coat that to me indicates that it more than likely would have been artillery as well, and that's the buttons. I mean, they're very clearly all throughout the body right here and on the cuffs and the tails. They are actually artillery buttons. So they're a brass button that's been stamped with a eagle standing on top of a cannon, and it just literally says artillery over the top of the button. Um, so that's a pretty good indication that it is an artillery uniform, but at the same time, we see lots of examples of uniforms from this time period that don't actually have buttons that truly correspond to their branch of service. So for instance, just in the museum collection here alone, we have one artillery uniform that has infantry buttons on it. We have another light infantry uniform that has naval buttons on it. We even have a cavalry uniform that has artillery buttons on it. So it does seem like in some instances, they would either just find a button that corresponded to the color of metal that was specified in the regulations, or in some cases, they just went for whatever button they thought would be the most attractive, which certainly would not be unheard of given the fact that you see a lot of instances of these uniforms worn by volunteer companies of various kinds, not really following the regulations very closely, and in some cases going far afield of what they were actually required to be wearing if they were serving in, say, an artillery company. So if we look at the code itself, um, there's a couple things about construction that I'd like to, to talk about just to give you an idea of how we can date this piece. So first off, if we look at the waist seam right here, which goes and actually joins the back tails to the body of the coat, 
Um, that is one indication that it is probably made post-1825. That's a detail that you start to see right around that time period in tailoring manuals. Before that, the front body panel was usually joined with the tails, and that could pose some problems in terms of fitting the garment. So actually adding the waist seam here gave the tailor a little bit more flexibility with, with shaping it to the individual. So that's one indication that it's probably at least in a mid 1820s garment, but probably leaning more towards the, the late 20s and early 30s. Um, also, if we look at the back of the garment, the back from shoulder to shoulder is, is fairly wide across there, but it is still fairly narrow going down into the lower part of the back. And that's something that we see again in tailoring manuals of that late 1820s to the 30s period. Um, so those are all really good ways that we can date this along with the date on the buttons and the rest. Now, why is this such an interesting piece for us to have in our museum collection? And we do have so many other militia uniforms. And that really is because of the way it's constructed. So there's a lot of unique features about how this piece is constructed that really differs from what is more generally seen with militia uniforms here in our collection and, and others that I've seen as well. Um, so first off, we look at the material. Most militia uniforms, because they are dress coats, they're meant to be these really impressive, well-made, and, and usually fairly expensive uniforms, um, they're usually gonna be made out of what's called a wool broadcloth. So it's a very, very fine quality wool cloth that has a shine to it. So it's really impressive, very commonly used for outer garments, but usually very typically used for militia uniforms. In the case of this garment though, it's actually made out of a fairly coarse worsted wool. So it doesn't actually have a piled nap. You can see the weave structure of the cloth. Um, it's lightweight, which would certainly make it comfortable in the summertime, but because it's lightweight, it also doesn't hold the shape very well. And many of the militia garments were very heavily tailored to give what was considered the most fashionable and, and kind of dashing silhouette for a soldier in the period. So part of the way they would have done that is actually adding wadding into the breast panels here, literally sewing in these panels of some kind of curled animal hair. Um, sometimes it was uncarded wool, and that would help to give the nice rounded chest that, was appeared, that, that appears to be so common in the period. But in this case, not only do we have it made out of a lighter wool that doesn't really hold the structure as well, it's also not wadded in the chest. So it's kind of an interesting feature about how it's put together. Also, if we look at the fact that it has a velvet collar on the inside, despite the fact that it's not actually made out of the best quality wool, the velvet collar is usually something that's more reserved for officers' uniforms in the period. So there's kind of an interesting juxtaposition of the materials here in, in different locations. Uh, and the final thing about this that's really unique and interesting is the fact that although there are literally dozens of buttons on this uniform, they don't actually close it in any way. So all of these buttons that you see going down the front here are false. And behind the buttons are actually some brass hooks and eyes that secure the front of the garment together. You can't see that when it's actually closed, and certainly with, with leather straps and belts over it, it wouldn't be possible to see it at all. But it is a fairly unique feature, because although you do certainly see other examples of coats, even here in the museum collection, that close with brass hooks and eyes in the front, Usually it's not in conjunction with the buttons going over them. So it's really kind of a unique feature. So all of these, these construction details combined really indicate to me that this is probably a coatee that was worn by a volunteer artilleryman serving in more of a rural area of the state of Connecticut. Uh, if this was a coat from say Hartford or New Haven uh, or some of the, the more urban centers in Connecticut in the period, it would have more than likely been made out of much finer materials and, and hit a slightly higher bar in terms of how it was actually tailored in keeping with the fashion. So the fact this is kind of a step below that indicates to me that it might have been worn by more of a rural militia company, which is a really neat piece for us to have in our museum collection since most of our coats tend to be more of that really high quality um, that was more common in, in the time period. So really a neat piece to see. So again, we're really excited to have this piece in the museum's collection. It does add a, a really kind of unique example to our collection of militia uniforms from New England in the pre-1840 period. Um, and we hope that you can make it out to the museum and, and hopefully see it on display sometime soon.